Hi, and welcome to the Sigma Pad. In this episode, we're going to take a look at these fascinating devices. Now, I typically don't really collect old test and measurement equipment. If you want to see some repair of old equipment, Mr. Carlson's lab would be a great channel for you. He has what appears to be an unlimited patience to work on these devices. But every once in a while, I like to collect something that has a bit of history to it and also has some very nice design, especially mechanical design. So these are frequency meters, and of course on their own they can't measure frequency, but they do have a measuring scale here which you can rotate, and there, is, there are two red lines over here with a marker in the middle which points to a particular frequency. And as you can see by the many I have here, they also cover different frequencies. I'm actually only missing one, and that's the one that sits between these two frequency bands, and that's I just hasn't arrived yet. I finally managed to find all of them on eBay. So these ones are actually coaxial, so they have type N connectors on each end, and they start around just under 1 gigahertz to 4 gigahertz, and this goes from 4 to 12, then 12 to 18, and the one I'm missing is 18 to 26, this is 26 to 40, and the last one is actually W band, which is 75 to 110 gigahertz. So you can make this at any frequency because the fundamental principle of operation has to do with cavities and I'll describe that a little bit later. So this is essentially a way to detect if a signal is present at a certain frequency uh, at a certain band but you don't have any other way of measuring it. If you have only a power detector and this thing you would be able to find out where that frequency comes from. And these things have extraordinary high quality factor over 1500 and that allows you to measure something very accurately. So let's figure out how they actually work and then we do some experiments with them. So let's take a look at one of these closer. This is the largest unit. This is model 3536A and look how beautiful it is. This thing is built like a tank. It has two ports, one on the left, one on the right and these are coaxial of course and they, there's no difference between them. This is a fully bi-directional device. It's purely passive. It's non-magnetic. So yeah, you just connect any of these and then you connect the other side to the detector. I'll describe how this works in detail. But look at this construction. So in order to read a measurement across a really wide frequency range while simultaneously having precision, they have divided this into a spiral where there are two red markers which move, which stay in place essentially with respect to each other and they just move up and down the scale as you rotate and they're trapped between these two slits so these two red pieces cannot move and there's a line in the middle and that's where you read the value. This one squeaks a little bit. But yeah, look, it's just so nice. And uh, this, if you unwrap this, this is a very, very long scale. And you can see that it's not linear. And that has to do with the cavity. I'll describe why that is uh, after we take a look at how it's constructed on the inside. Unfortunately, I can't take these apart because they're quite difficult to put back together. And I want to preserve them. There's some sensitivity in the way they connect. But we can still see kind of what's inside of it from the diagrams. Now, the coaxial one is, of course, you know, a line going from in and out. So there's not much to see. But on the waveguide ones, it's amazing, because if you look through it, you don't see anything. It's just basically completely through. But if you look carefully, you might be able to see that there's a tiny little hole right there in the corner. So it means that there is a bit of leakage allowed to enter the cavity that's inside this, and that's all that is needed. It's amazing. It's almost like magic. And yeah, that's it. That's all there is. So it really, you can see that these are basically a through as far as it is concerned for all the frequencies except for somewhere where it can create the resonance. This leaky waveguide structure is actually quite common. It's used for power detectors and for coupling and for measuring something without disturbing the actual waveguide path that you're trying to measure. So yeah, this is used all the time. It's just that it's nice to see it on this one because it is such a wide and such a large waveguide interface. So how do these things work anyway? Now one thing I forgot to mention is that these things are built in the mid-1960s. It's almost two decades before I was even born, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but of course these things were still expensive back then, about $500, but much, much cheaper than traditional ways or other ways of measuring frequency uh, or measuring frequency with higher precisions. About 0.1% is the accuracy of these units, which is good enough for a wide range of applications, of course. But they also haven't been calibrated for half a century, so I'm curious to see how they perform. So here's the exploded view of this frequency meter. So it's a purely passive device and you can see the different sections here. Here are the coaxial connectors going in and this is where all the magic happens. This is where the cavity is. The rest of it are basically supporting components and measurements and adjusting and keeping track of where the size of the cavity is. So there is a worm screw of some kind that is moving in and out of this cavity 
and that can give you a very precise adjustment if it's done correctly and you can read where the location of that screw is and translate that to a frequency of the cavity resonance and that is exactly what's going on here so let's take a look at the cross section of it there's not that many good high resolution photos of what's inside but this one I think will get the point across so here's our cavity that's our cavity at the bottom here and here's our coaxial line going in so energy goes in or signal goes in there's a strip line here this allows it to couple into the cavity and then it continues forward and going out which means that this thing is basically a through so the energy that goes in just comes out of the other side you can just treat this as any 50 ohm transmission line with a minor coupling into a cavity so the cavity is allowed to steal energy and steal power away from that line at the point of resonance now the question is how do you adjust this cavity well you adjust it by moving this piston up and down now this all sounds quite simple because you're changing the size of the cavity effectively but it's quite difficult for RF frequencies because how this is built how well it is electrically connected to the walls of the cavity and how well it is isolated from everything else is really important otherwise you're just going to get a mess of response in your entire transmission band you're not going to get a nice resonance so they have a chokes area here which is isolated so they have very good electrical contacts here while having air gaps here and here to separate this piston from the rest that's difficult to do these things have to be extremely well machined and these gaps are, have to be absolutely tiny so they present themselves an RF short but they also have to be an electrical short here uh, actually conductive short so it's pretty difficult to do the first surface finish of these are silver and that's the best material you can use if you can isolate it fairly well so it doesn't tarnish as easily and the rest is basically mechanical at the bottom of this they have a capacitive load and this capacitive load in conjunction with this cavity allows them to not have multiple resonances and that multiple resonances is important because if you let's say you tune this to one gigahertz you don't want it to react at two gigahertz and at three gigahertz as well these are by the way quarter wavelength cavities here so this is all done quite cleverly with uh, proper EM modeling of this remember this is in the mid 60s and uh, the, the rest of it is again as I said uh, mostly just mechanical precision there and as you move this up and down the size changes and that's why the scale is not linear that has to do with the quarter wavelength cavity resonances and so on and what happens at resonance is some energy is coupled from this strip line into the cavity and absorbed into the cavity now that dip is not very large so don't mistake this with a band stop filter it's really not a band stop filter it's just a cavity with a very high quality factor resonance about 1500 that allows to have resonance at only one frequency within the specified range so if you look at the specification over here you can see that the dip you can achieve is only about 1 dB or at least 1 dB in practice is actually quite a bit better which means that when you hit the frequency of resonance the power drops by about 1 to 2 dB and that's it but if you have a good detector you can catch that and you can see exactly where that dip is if you have a frequency there the power will drop by 1 to 1 and a half dB and here is a setup for our first experiment and as I said in a couple of other videos I'm going to try and stick to one vendor test equipment so we can stay within one ecosystem for the different tutorials experiments and repairs that we do today we're going to use mostly Siglent for our experiments so here we have the power meter which I can of course turn as you can see and it does make a squeaky noise in one direction but not in the other I think it needs to be adjusted a little bit and at the input we have an RF power coming in I'll show you where the source of that is on the other side of this we have a power detector this is an HP 641E detector this is a diode detector that goes all the way up to 12 gigahertz and it's a very basic structure it's essentially a self mixer the diode will absorb RF power self mix it down to DC and produce a DC output this is a fairly sensitive one it produces I think a couple of millivolts per microwatt of input power and it has a negative power coefficient so the more power you put into it a more negative number it will produce at the bottom over here I have a Lacroix differential amplifier this is really not that necessary but it allows us to essentially amplify the small changes that we see out of the detector helps it a little bit uh, be easier to detect it also has another nice feature I can set a constant DC voltage on one side so that this voltage gets subtracted from that DC voltage it means that I can put this power meter into a default state zero it out so that any changes in the detector output will be around a zero bias that's just convenience and a little bit easier to see so right now everything is turned off so there's of course nothing going on now in terms of the measurement at the back I'm going to use a Citlin STM 3065X which is a six and a half digit multimeter so it's going to give us a nice clean reading at the very top over here 
I'm also going to use the Siglent SSG 5060X-V. This is an instrument I'm currently reviewing. It's a vector modulator all the way up to 6 GHz with a lot of bandwidth and some really nice features. I'm quite impressed with that. We will see a full review and teardown of this later on. And on the left side over here, I have a network analyzer from Siglent as well, which we will use to measure this a little bit after. So let's go ahead and take a look at the settings on the RF generator so we can see what kind of numbers come out. So here's the Siglent Vector Signal Generator. Let's set it up to some basic settings. Let's try 2.5 GHz here. Now one of the things to keep in mind is that this particular model has the OCX option, the Oven Controlled Crystal Oscillator, meaning that it produces very, very accurate output frequency. So 2.5 GHz is indeed almost exactly what we're going to get out. Let's set the level to 0 dBm over here. Okay, so that's it. Pretty straightforward. Now, we're not using the vector modulator capabilities of this yet, which means that this is going to generate only a single tone output at exactly 2.5 GHz. We can go ahead and turn it on. There we go. Basic setting. Let's go back to the measurement. Okay, so first thing, let's zero out the multimeter. So keep an eye out on this measurement over here, and I'm going to adjust this until we get about zero. There you go. That's almost there. A little bit more. There you go. That's good enough. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Let's be a little bit more accurate while we're at it. There you go, about 9 millivolt. That's fine. So essentially, we are now at zero. And I can see if I turn this, of course, nothing happens because we're not at the right frequency setting. So let's change this a little bit so we can get a bit more faster measurement. There you go. So now we have a nice bar graph at the bottom. So we are reading nothing, of course. So keep an eye on. We want to maximize this number and maximize this on the bar. Let's search for the frequency. Let's see if we see anything. At some point, we should see something. Oh, I think I saw something. There we go. Look at that. There it is. So I'm going to adjust until I get the highest number. I think that's roughly the highest number I could get. <laughs> and check this out. I mean, look at this. How is that for accuracy? Keep in mind that this thing probably hasn't been calibrated in half a century. And we're reading exactly two and a half gigahertz. I, I just, you have to be amazed at the fact that how precise this instrument is, how perfectly machined that cavity is, how well the connections are, that this works as well as it does after almost 50, 60 years. It's really quite impressive, the instrument that HP was making back then. So if I go just a little bit above, you see, that's it. It's, it's gone. We're past the cavity. And go a little bit to the left, again, we're past the cavity. So it is extremely precise and extremely sensitive. And we can do this at almost any frequency within the band. And we can do it across all the different frequency meters that we have. So you can imagine why a setting like this is really useful, because all you need is a detector and a multimeter, and you can measure something. Put yourself in the 60s, where you know, spectrum analyzers and these things didn't exist like they do now. This is a very, very inexpensive way of detecting fairly high frequencies right in the lab. But now we can make it even more complicated. We can detect more than one tone at a time. Now, because we have the frequency meter with such a high quality factor in the cavity, we should be able to differentiate tones that are even very close to each other, so detect multiple frequencies at the same time. Let's go and set it up using the vector signal generator over here. So I'm going to go under I and Q. I'm going to go under multi-tone. The screen is really nice, by the way. And you can see I have here the number of tones set to 2, and the tone spacing to 20 megahertz. It does a little bit strange calculation of the tone spacing. It assumes that the upper and lower sideband are both selected. But anyway, we can figure that out. Let's go ahead and turn the single sideband on, meaning that it will only apply these tones on the upper sideband or the lower sideband, so that we can also check on the spectrum analyzer. And we'll turn the multi-tone on. And finally, enable the modulation. So now what's coming out of this instrument is no longer a single tone, but rather two of them fairly close to each other. We can also look at it directly in the spectrum analyzer to see what's coming out. So let's use the SVA1032X, which I've done a full teardown and review of also in the past, to look at the tones coming out of the vector signal generator. As I said, there are two tones. Here are the two. 2.51 GHz is the frequency of the first one, and 2.52 GHz is the frequency of the second one. So they're really close to each other, uh, at least for you know something like a frequency meter. For a spectrum analyzer, there is no challenge. The tone in the middle is the yellow leakage you're seeing, and it's doing a pretty good job. It has a fairly good performance, considering that it's generating two tones directly for its own built-in arbitrary waveform generator. I can turn the single sideband off, so you can see what happens. Then you get the tones on both of the uh, carrier there. So we only want to look at one side. So let's try and find our multiple tones. I'm zooming in a little bit more so you can see. Now keep in mind that 
we're not going to see the same deflection in the measured power here because this detector is detecting both of the tones at the same time. So you're ha seeing the accumulated power of the two. And when you go over a cavity for one of the tones, you drop by about dB, dB and a half of one of the tones only. And therefore, the total change in the output power detected is going to be less than before. The change is less than of the total value. So you will see a smaller difference. This also means that as you increase the number of tones, it's going to be harder and harder to detect them because the changes will be smaller and smaller with respect to the total. So let's go ahead and search for it. So here's 2.5 gigahertz at the beginning. We don't see anything because there's no tone there now anymore. We keep increasing. And I'm oh, there you go. I'm beginning to see something. Oh, I think we missed it. Go back. There you go, I think this is the peak, roughly, and <laughs> check it out. It's exactly where it's supposed to be. Look at that, right in the middle, 2.51. So we're, that's to one of the tones, that's the first one. And the other one should be around 2.52, so let's go around there. See if you see it. There you go, it's going back up. We passed it again. There you go, check it out, 2.52. So it's amazing. It works, and it works with multiple tones as well. All you need is a detector. Quite impressive. Now, what we also want to do is to maybe connect this to a network analyzer and see the quality factor of that dip and see if it's exactly about what we're expecting at about a dB, a dB and a half. That should be an easy setup. So let's go ahead and measure the response through the frequency meter. Now, we don't really need to measure an S parameter. We don't need a vector measurement. We can just do a scalar measurement so we can see the dip in the resonance point of this. So I have it connected directly across the SVA 1032 access tracking generator and RF input ports. And I've already calibrated everything so we should be able to see it. So right now, it is set to be beyond the range of what's on the screen, which is from 2.25 gigahertz to 2.75 gigahertz. So it's going to turn this until we see the resonance within the display. And it should come in any second now. There it is. And look at that. That is beautiful. Look at how high quality factor this is, exactly as we were expecting about a Q of 1500. Now, note it also that it exceeds its specification by quite a bit. It's only really rated to about 1 to 1.5 dB, but the dip actually goes all the way to 2.5 dB down. This is a half a dB per division scale there. And I can move it around, of course. Here I can move it all the way to the other end. Let's say somewhere around here. There you go, you can see it works really, really well. Now keep in mind that making a cavity with such a resonance is not difficult on its own, but it is very difficult to make it over such a huge frequency band and maintaining the cavity but not having any other resonances, which is one of the features of these frequency meters. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick video. Thanks again to all my Patreon supporters. This is exactly where the Patreon support goes into, buying these detectors and these frequency meters so we can run these kind of experiments. And I'll, to do, I'll try to do more and more of these as we go in the future. There are lots of these cool little things that we can do experiments with. Let me know what you think in the comment section. I'll see you next time.